Benjamin H. Friedman was one of the most intriguing and amazing individuals of the 20th century. Mr. Friedman, born in 1890, was a successful Jewish businessman of New York City who was at one time the principal owner of the Woodbury Soap Company. He broke with organized Jewry after World War II and spent the remainder of his life and the great preponderance of his considerable fortune at least two and a half million dollars exposing the Jewish power structure which dominates the United States. Mr. Friedman's testimony is especially important because he had been an insider at the highest levels of Jewish organizations and Jewish machinations to gain power over our nation. Mr. Friedman was personally acquainted with Bernard Baruch, Samuel Untermeyer, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Joseph Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, and many more movers and shakers of our times. This speech was given before a patriotic audience in 1961 at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., on behalf of Condi McGinley's patriotic newspaper of that time, Common Sense. Though in some minor ways this wide-ranging and extemporaneous speech has become dated, Mr. Friedman's essential message to us his warning to the West is more urgent than ever before. Listen. Here in the United States, the Zionists and their co-religionists have complete control of our government. For many reasons, too many and too complex to go in here, at this time, I'll be glad to answer questions, however, to support that statement, the Zionists and their co-religionists rule this United States as though they were the absolute monarchs of this country. Now you say, well, that's a very broad statement to make, but let me show what happened while you were... I don't want to wear that out. Let me show you what happened while we were all asleep. I'm including myself with you. We were all asleep. What happened? World War I broke out in the summer of 1914. 1914 was the year in which World War I broke out. There are a few people here my age who remember that. Now that war was waged on one side by Great Britain, France, and Russia, and on the other side by Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey. What happened? Within two years, Germany had won that war. Not alone won it nominally, but won it actually. The German submarines, which were a surprise to the world, had swept all the convoys from the Atlantic Ocean, and Great Britain stood there without ammunition for her soldiers, stood there with one week's food supply facing her, and after that, starvation. At that time, the French army had mutiny. They lost 600,000 of the flower of the French youth in the defense of Verdun on the Somme. The Russian army was defecting. They were picking up their toys and going home. They didn't want to play war anymore. They didn't like the Tsar. And the Italian army had collapsed. Now, Germany, not a shot had been fired on the German soil. Not an enemy soldier had crossed the border into Germany. And yet, here was Germany offering England peace terms. They offered England a negotiated peace on what the lawyers call a status quo ante basis. That means let's call the war off and let everything be as it was before the war started. Well, England in the summer of 1916 was considering that seriously. They had no choice. They were either accepting this negotiated peace that Germany was magnanimously offering them or going on with the war and being totally defeated. While that was going on, the Zionists in Germany who represented the Zionists from Eastern Europe, went to the British War Cabinet 
And I'm going to be brief because this is a long story, but I have all the documents to prove any statement that I make. If anyone here is curious or doesn't believe what I am possible. The Zionists in London went to the British War Cabinet and they said, look here, you can yet win this war. You don't have to give up. You don't have to accept a negotiated peace offered to you now by Germany. You can win this war if the United States will come in as your ally. The United States was not in the war at that time. We were fresh, we were young, we were rich, we were powerful. And they told England, we will guarantee to bring the United States into the war as your ally, to fight with you on your side, if you will promise us Palestine after you win the war. In other words, they made this deal. We will get the United States into this war as your ally. The price you must pay us is Palestine after you have won the war and defeated Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey. Now, England had as much right to promise Palestine to anybody as the United States would have to promise Japan to Ireland for any reason whatsoever. It's absolutely absurd that Great Britain, that never had any connection or any interest or any right in what is known as Palestine, should offer it as coin of the realm to pay the Zionists for bringing the United States into the war. However, they made that promise in October of 1916. October 1916. And shortly after that, I don't know how many here remember it, the United States, which was almost totally pro-German, totally pro-German, because the newspapers here were controlled by Jews, the bankers were Jews, all the media of mass communications in this country were controlled by Jews, and they were pro-German because their people, in a majority of cases, came from Germany, and they wanted to see Germany lick the Tsar. The Jews didn't like the Tsar, and they didn't want Russia to win this war. So the German bankers, the German Jews, Kuhn Loh, and the other big banking firms in the United States refused to finance France or England to the extent of one dollar. They stood aside and they said, as long as France and England are tied up with Russia, not one cent. But they poured money into Germany, they fought with Germany against Russia, trying to lick the Tsarist regime. Now, those same Jews, when they saw the possibility of getting Palestine, they went to England and they made this deal. At that time, everything changed, like the traffic light that changes from red to green, where the newspapers had been all pro-German, -Ger pro where they'd been telling the people the difficulties that Germany was having fighting Great Britain commercially and in other respects. All of a sudden, the Germans were no good. They were villains, they were Huns, they were shooting Red Cross nurses, they were cutting off babies' hands, and they were no good. Well, shortly after that, Mr. Wilson declared war on Germany. The Zionists in London sent these cables to the United States to Justice Brandeis, go to work on President Wilson. We're getting from England what we want, now you go to work, and you go to work on President Wilson and get the United States into the war. And that did happen. That's how the United States got into the war. We had no more interest in it. We had no more right to be in it than we have to be on the moon tonight instead of in this room. Now, the war, World War I, in which the United States participated, had absolutely no reason to be our war. We went in there, we were railroaded into it. If I can be vulgar, we were suckered into that war merely so that the Zionists of the world could obtain Palestine. Now, that 
is something that the people in the United States have never been told. They never knew why we went into World War I. Now, what happened? After we got into the war, the Zionists went to Great Britain, and they said, well, we performed our part of the agreement. Let's have something in writing that shows that you are going to keep your bargain and give up Palestine after you win the war. Because they didn't know whether the war would last another year or another ten years. So they started to work out a receipt. The receipt took the form of a letter, and it was worded in very cryptic language so that the world at large wouldn't know what it was all about. And that was called the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was merely Great Britain's promise to pay the Zionists what they had agreed upon as a consideration for getting the United States into the war. So this great Balfour Declaration that you hear so much about is just as phony as a $3 bill, and I don't think I can make it more emphatic than that. Now, that is where all the trouble started. The United States was in the war. The United States crushed Germany. We went in there, and it's history. You know what happened. Now, when the war was ended, and the Germans went to Paris, to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, there were 117 Jews there as a delegation representing the Jews, headed by Bernard Baruch. I was there, I ought to know. Now what happened? The Jews at that peace conference, when they were cutting up Germany and parceling out Europe to all these nations that claimed a right to a certain part of European territory, the Jews said, how about Palestine for us? And they produced, for the first time, to the knowledge of German, this Balfour Declaration. So the Germans, for the first time, realized, oh, that was the game. That's why the United States came into the war. And the Germans, for the first time, realized that they were defeated. They suffered this terrific reparation that was slapped onto them because the Zionists wanted Palestine and they were determined to get it at any cost. Now, that brings us up to another very interesting point. When the Germans realized this, they naturally resented it. Up to that time, the Jews had never been better off in any country in the world than they had been in Germany. You had Mr. Rossenau there, who was maybe 100 times as important in industry and finance as Bernard Baruch in this country. You had Mr. Balin, who owned the two big steamship lines, the North German Lloyd and the uh, uh, Hamburg American Line, thank you. You had uh, Mr. Bleichroeder, who was the banker for the Hohenzollern family. You had the Warburgs in Hamburg, who were the big merchant bankers, the biggest in the world, the Jews were doing very well in Germany. No question about that. Now, the Germans felt, well, that was quite a sellout. It was a sellout that I can best compare. Suppose the United States was at war today with the Soviet Union. And we were winning. And we told the Soviet Union, well, let's quit. We offer you peace terms. Let's forget the whole thing. And all of a sudden, Red China came into the war as an ally of the Soviet Union. And throwing them into the war brought about our defeat, a crushing defeat, with a reparation the likes of which man's imagination cannot encompass. Imagine, then, if we found out that it was the Chinese in this country, our Chinese citizens, who all the time we thought they were loyal citizens working with us, were selling us out 
to the Soviet Union, and it was through them that Great China was brought into the war against us. How would we feel in the United States against Chinese? I don't think one of them would dare show his face on any street. There wouldn't be lampposts enough convenient to take care of them. Imagine how we would feel. Well, that's how the Germans felt towards these Jews. We've been so nice to them, and from 1905 on, when the first communist revolution in Russia failed, and the Jews had to scramble out of Russia, they all went to Germany, and Germany gave them refuge, and they were treated very nicely. And here, they sold Germany down the river for no reason at all, other than they wanted Palestine as a so-called Jewish commonwealth. Now, Nahum Sokolov, all the great leaders, the big names that you read about in connection with Zionism today, they, in 1919, 1920, 21, 22, and 23, they wrote in all their papers, and the press was filled with their statements, that the feeling against the Jews in Germany is due to the fact that they realized that this great defeat was brought about by our intercession and bringing the United States into the war against them. The Jews themselves admitted that. It wasn't that the Germans in 1919 discovered that a glass of Jewish blood tasted better than Coca-Cola or Munchen of beer. There was no religious feeling. There was no sentiment against those people merely on account of their religious belief. It was all political. It was economic. It was anything but religious. Nobody cared in Germany whether a Jew went home and pulled down the shades and said Shema Yisrael or our father. No one cared in Germany any more than they do in the United States. Now this feeling that developed later in Germany was due to one thing, that the Germans held the Jews responsible for their crushing defeat for no reason at all, because World War I was started against Germany for no reason for which they were responsible. They were guilty of nothing, only of being successful. They built up a big navy. They built up world trade. You must remember, Germany, at the time of Napoleon, at the time of the French Revolution, what was the German Reich, consisted of 300, 300 small city-states, principalities, dukedoms, and so forth. 300 little separate political entities. And between that time, between the period of, between Napoleon and Bismarck, they were consolidated into one state. And within 50 years after that time, they became one of the world's great powers. Their navy was rivaling Great Britain. They were doing business all over the world. They could undersell anybody and make better products. And what happened? What happened as a result of that? There was a conspiracy between England, France, and Russia that we must slap down Germany. Because there isn't one historian in the world that can find a valid reason why those three countries decided to wipe Germany off the map politically. Now what happened after that? When Germany realized that the Jews were responsible for her defeat, they naturally resented it. But not a hair on the head of any Jew was harmed. Not a single hair. Professor Tanzel of Georgetown University, who had access to all the secret papers of the State Department, wrote in his book and quoted from a State Department document written by uh, Hugo Schoenfeld, a Jew who Cordell Hall sent to Europe in 1933 to investigate the so-called camps of political prisoners. And he wrote back that he found them in very fine condition. They were in excellent shape. Everybody treated well. And they were filled with communists. Well, a lot of them were Jews, because the Jews happened to be maybe 98% of the communists in Europe at that time.
And there were some priests there and ministers, labor leaders, masons, and others who had international affiliation. Now, the Jews sort of tried to keep the lid on this fact. They didn't want the world to really understand that they had sold out Germany and that the Germans resented that. So they did take appropriate action against them. They, shall I say, discriminated against them wherever they could. They shunned them. The same as we would the Chinese or the Negroes or the Catholics or anyone in this country that sold us out to an enemy and brought about our defeat. Now, after a while, the Jews of the world didn't know what to do. So they called a meeting in Amsterdam. Jews from every country in the world attended in July 1933. And they said to Germany, you fire Hitler and you put every Jew back into his former position, whether he was a communist, no matter what he was. You can't treat us that way. And we, the Jews of the world, are calling upon you and serving this other madam upon you. Well, the Germans told them, you can imagine. So what did they do? In 1917, the communists took over Germany for a few days. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and a group of Jews in Germany took over the government for three days. In fact, when the Kaiser ended the war, he fled to Holland because he thought the communists were going to take over Germany as they did Russia and that he was going to meet the same fate that the Tsar did in Russia. So he left and went to Holland uh, for safety and for security. Now, the, uh, at that time, when the communist threat in Germany was quashed, it was quiet, the Jews were working still trying to get back into their former their status, and the Germans fought them in every way they could without hurting a hair on anyone's head. The same as one group, the uh, prohibitionists, fought the people who were interested in liquor, and they didn't fight one another with pistols. They did it every way they could. Well, that's the way they were fighting the Jews in Germany. And at that time, mind you, there were 80 to 90 million Germans, and there were only 460,000 Jews. Less than one half of one percent of the population of Germany were Jews. And yet, they controlled all the press, they controlled most of the economy, because they had come in and with cheap money, you know the way the mark was devalued, they bought up practically everything. Well, in 1933, when the Germany refused to surrender, mind you, to the World Conference of Jews in Amsterdam, they broke up and Mr. Undermeyer came back to the United States, who was the head of the American delegation and the president of the whole conference, and he went from the steamer to ABC and made a radio broadcast throughout the United States in which he said, the Jews of the world now declare a holy war against Germany. We are now engaged in a sacred conflict against the Germans, and we are going to solve them into surrender. We are going to use a worldwide boycott against them that will destroy them because they are dependent upon their export business. And it is a fact that two-thirds of Germany's food supply had to be imported, and it could only be imported with the proceeds of what they exported, their labor. So if Germany could not export, two-thirds of Germany's population would have to starve. There just was not enough food for more than one-third of a population. Now, in this declaration, which I have here, it was printed and paid, a whole page, 
in the New York Times on August 7, 1933, Mr. Samuel Untermeyer boldly stated that this economic boycott is our means of self-defense. President Roosevelt has advocated its use in the NRA, which some of you may remember, where everybody was to be boycotted unless they followed the rules laid down by the New Deal, which of course is declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court at that time. Nevertheless, the Jews of the world declared a boycott against Germany, and it was so effective that you couldn't find one thing in any store anywhere in the world with the words made in Germany on it. In fact, an executive of the Woolworth Company told me that they had to dump millions of dollars worth of crockery and dishes into the river, that their stores were boycotted. If anyone came in and found a dish mark made in Germany, they were picketed with signs, Hitler, murderer, and so forth, and like something like these sit-ins that are taking place in the South. R.H. Macy, which is controlled by a family called Strauss, who are, also happened to be Jews, a woman found stockings there, which came from Chemnitz, marked made in Germany. Well, they were cotton stockings. They may have been there 20 years, because of, uh, since I've been observing women's legs in the last 20 years, I haven't seen a pair with cotton stockings on them. So Macy, I saw Macy boycotted with hundreds of people walking around with signs, murderers, and Hitlerites, and so forth. Now, up to that time, not one hair of any Jew had been hurt in Germany. There was no suffering, there was no starvation, there was no murder, there was nothing. Now, that, naturally, the Germans said, why, who are these people to declare a boycott against us and throw all our people out of work and our industries come to a standstill? Who are they to do that to us? And they naturally resented it. Certainly they painted swastikas on stores owned by Jews. Why should a German go in and give their money to a storekeeper who is part of a boycott, who is going to starve Germany into surrender into the Jews of the world? who are going to dictate who their premier or chancellor was to be. Well, it was ridiculous. That continued for some time. And it wasn't until 1938 when a young Jew from Poland walked into the German embassy in Paris and shot one of the officials that the Germans really started to get rough with the Jews in Germany and you found the men breaking windows and having street fights and so forth. Now, for anyone to say that, I don't like to use the word anti-Semitism because it's meaningless, but it means something to you still, so I'll have to use it. The only reason that there was any feeling in Germany against Jews was that they were responsible, number one, for World War One, number two, for this worldwide boycott, and number three, did I say for World War I, they were responsible for the boycott and also for World War Two, because after this thing got out of hand, it was absolutely necessary for the Jews and Germany to lock horns in a war to see which one was going to survive. In the meanwhile, I had lived in Germany and I knew that the Germans had decided Europe is going to be Christian or communist. There is no in-between. It's going to be Christian or it's going to be communist. And the Germans decided we're going to keep it Christian if possible. And they started to rearm. And their intention was, by that time, the United States had recognized the Soviet Union, which they did in November 1933, the Soviet Union was becoming very powerful, and Germany realized, well, our turn is going to come soon unless we are strong. The same as we in this country are saying today, our turn is going to come soon unless we're strong, and our government is spending 83 or 84 billion dollars of your money for defense, they say. Defense against who? Defense against 40,000 little Jews in Moscow that took over Russia and then 
in their devious ways, took over control of many of the governments of the world. Now, for this country to now be on the verge of a third world war from which we cannot emerge a victor is something that staggers my imagination. I know, I know that nuclear bombs are measured in terms of megathon. A megathon is a term used to describe one million tons of TNT. One million tons of TNT is a megathon. Now, our nuclear bombs had a capacity of 10 megathons. 10 million tons of TNT. That was when they were first developed, five or six years ago. Now, the nuclear bombs that are being developed have a capacity of 200 megathons. And God knows how many megathons the nuclear bombs that the Soviet Union has to have a capacity. So what do we face now? If we trigger a world war that may develop into a nuclear war, humanity is finished. And why will it take place? It will take place because Act 3, the curtain goes up on Act 3. Act 1 was World War 1. Act 2 was World War 2. Act 3 is going to be World War 3. The Jews of the world, the Zionists, and their co-religionists everywhere are determined that they are going to again use the United States to help them permanently retain Palestine as their foothold for their world government. Now that is just as true as I'm standing here, because not alone have I read it, but many here have read it, and it's known all over the world. Now, what are we going to do? The life you save may be your son. Your boys may be on their way to that war tonight, and you don't know it any more than you knew that in 1916 in London, the Zionists made a deal with the British War Cabinet to send your sons to war in Europe. Did you know it at that time? Not a person in the United States knew it. You weren't permitted to know it. Who knew it? President Wilson knew it. Colonel House knew it. Others knew it. Did I know it? I had a pretty good idea of what was going on. I was liaison to Henry Morgenthau Sr. in the 1912 campaign when President Wilson was elected. And there was talk around the office there. I was confidential man to uh, Henry Morgenthau Sr., who was chairman of the Finance Committee, and I was liaison between him and Rolla Wells, the treasurer. So I sat in these meetings with President Wilson at the head of the table and all the others, and I heard them drum into President Wilson's brain the graduated income tax and what has become the Federal Reserve, and also indoctrinate him with the Zionist movement. And Justice Brandeis and President Wilson were just as close as the two fingers on this hand. And President Woodrow Wilson was just as incompetent when it came to determining what was going on as a newborn baby. And that's how they got us into World War I, why we all slept. Send our boys over there to be slaughtered for what? So the Jews can have Palestine as their commonwealth. They fooled you so much that you don't know whether you're coming or going. Now, any judge, when he charges a jury, says, gentlemen, any witness that you find has told a single lie, you can disregard all his testimony. That is correct. I don't know from what state you come, but in New York State, that is the way the judge addresses a jury. If that witness said one lie, disregard his testimony. Now, what are the facts? The Jews, I call them Jews to you because they're known as Jews. I don't call them Jews. I refer to them as so-called Jews because I know what they are. Now, what happened? The Eastern European Jews 
who form 92% of the world's population of those people who call themselves Jews, were originally Khazars. They were a warlike tribe that lived deep in the heart of Asia. And they were so warlike that even the Asiatics drove them out of Asia into Eastern Europe. And to reduce this so you don't get too confused about the history of Eastern Europe, they set up this big Khazar kingdom, 800,000 square miles. Only there was no Russia, there were no other countries, and the Khazar kingdom was the biggest country in all Europe. So big and so powerful that when the other monarchs wanted to go to war, the Khazars would loan them 40,000 soldiers. That's how big and powerful they were. Now, they were phallic worshippers, which is filthy. I don't want to go into the details of that now. It was their religion, the way it was the religion of many other pagans or barbarians elsewhere in the world. Now, the king became so disgusted with the degeneracy of his kingdom that he decided to adopt a so-called monotheistic faith, either Christianity, Islam, the Muslim faith, or what is known today as Judaism, really Talmudism. So, by spinning a top, he said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo," and he picked out so-called Judaism. And that became the state religion, and he sent down to uh, the uh, Talmudic schools of Talambitha and Surah, and brought up thousands of these rabbis with their teachings, and he opened up synagogues and schools in his kingdom of 800,000 people, 800,000 square miles, and maybe 10 to 20 million people, and they became what we call Jews. There wasn't one of them that ever had an ancestor that ever put a toe in the Holy Land, not alone in Old Testament history, but Back to time, the beginning of time. Not one of them. And yet they come to the Christians and they ask us to support their armed insurrection in Palestine by saying, well, you want to certainly help repatriate God's chosen people to their promised land, their ancestral homeland, Italy. We gave you one of our boys as your Lord and Savior. You now go to church on Sunday and kneel, and you worship a Jew, and we a Jew, well, they were pagan Khazars who were converted just the same as the Irish. And it's just as ridiculous to call them people of the Holy Land as it would be there are 54 million Chinese Muslims. 54 million. And Muhammad only died in 620 A.D., so... In that time, 54 million Chinese have accepted Islam as their religious belief. Now imagine in China, 2,000 miles away from Arabia, where the city of Mecca is located, where Muhammad was born. Imagine if the 54 million Chinese called themselves Arabs. Imagine why you say they're lunatic. Any man that believes that those 54 million Chinese or Arabs must be crazy. All they did was adopt as a religious faith a belief that had its origin in Mecca, in Arabia. The same as the Irish. When the Irish became Christians, nobody dumped them in the ocean and imported from the Holy Land a new crop of inhabitants that were Christians, that had Christian flesh and blood. They weren't different people. They were the same people, but they had accepted Christianity as their religious faith. Now these pagans, these Asiatics, these turco Finns, they were a mongoloid race who were forced out of Asia into Eastern Europe. They likewise because their king took the faith, the Talmudic faith, they had no choice. Just the same as in Spain. If the king was Catholic, everybody had to be a Catholic. If not, you had to get out of Spain. 
So everybody, they lived on the land, just like the trees in the bushes, the human being belonged to the land under that feudal system. So they all became what we call today Jews. Now imagine how silly it was for the Christians, for the great Christian countries of the world to say, we are going to use our power, our prestige, to help repatriate God's chosen people to their ancestral homeland, their promised land. Now, could there be a bigger lie than that? Could there be a bigger lie than that? And because they control the newspapers, the magazines, the radio, the television, the book publishing business, they have the ministers in the pulpit, they have the politicians on the soapboxes talking the same language. So naturally, you believe black is white if you heard it often enough. You wouldn't call black black anymore. You'd start to call black white, and nobody could blame you. Now, that is one of the great lies that is the foundation of all the misery that has befallen the world. Do you know that on the Day of Atonement that you think is so sacred to them, that on that day, and I was one of them, this is not hearsay. I'm not here to be a rabble rouser. I'm here to give you facts. When on the Day of Atonement you walk into a synagogue, the very first prayer that you recite, you stand, and it's the only prayer for which you stand, and you repeat three times a short prayer, the Kalnidra. You enter into an agreement with God Almighty that any oath, vow, or pledge that you may make during the next 12 years, the 12 months, any oath, vow, or pledge that you may take during the next 12 months shall be null and void, the oath shall not be an oath, the vow shall not be a vow, the pledge shall not be a pledge, they shall have no force and effect, and so forth and so on. And further than that, the Talmud teaches, don't forget, whenever you take an oath, vow, and pledge, remember the Kalnidra prayer that you recited on the Day of Atonement, and that exempts you from fulfilling that. How much can you depend upon their loyalty? You can depend upon their loyalty as much as the Germans depended upon it in 1916. And we're going to suffer the same fate that Germany suffered, and for the same reasons. 